Welcome to Unstoppable Podcast with Harry Sardinas, inspiring conversations with influential millionaires, investors, thought leaders, entrepreneurs who are making a massive difference with their innovative products and services and sharing the challenges and wisdom of how they sold their first million. How would you like to achieve your first million? And today we are with Shande, someone that is passionate to help small business to grow. So Shande, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Harry. My name is Chandler Lyles. I'm a owner of a digital advertising agency called Hybe Marketing. Uh, I've been in, I've been an entrepreneur for a little over a decade now, and wow. uh, I'm really excited to be with you and, and share some of these uh, pain points I've had over the last decade. So Chandra, tell us why you decide to become an entrepreneur. I it's a sick passion. Uh it's a sickness, I think, at the end of the day. My wife and I were talking about this a couple months back when she was asking me why I subjected myself to this sort of torture. And it's it's truly <laughs> exactly. because I can't help but do it. You know, it's something that every time I've gone to work for somebody else, I just I just daydream about working on my own and I just feel called to it. Um And I think that that's what makes a really great entrepreneur because, you know, owning a small business is incredibly difficult. You know, here in the States, we found out through the SBA, our small business administration, that uh, the majority of entrepreneurs in our country make about $46,000 a year. And wow. that's that's a very small salary compared to like what somebody with that same talent level could go earn in corporate America. And not only is it a, it's a, it's a smaller salary, the risk of being an entrepreneur is so much higher than going to go work in some corporation. And so you're going to take an outsized financial risk for very proven limited upside financially. And why would you do that? You have to be driven with some sick compulsion. Otherwise there's no point. Yeah. And then the Shanda, the thing is that for someone that man managed to turn around the, the situation, then it's, Is, is can be amazing because you can have more uh, freedom with your time. You can your business can run the not pilot. You can travel the world. You can you can do a lot of things. I, I it's funny how you said that. Why we go into this <laughs> into this torture? Because at the end of the day, building a, a business at the beginning is 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 hard. It's challenging. You are by yourself. It's difficult to find the right clients. It's difficult to find the the right people to work uh, as a team. So where do you get the inspiration? Do you, I think it's anyone in your family is an entrepreneur? You read the book, what happened? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I I don't come from a long line of entrepreneurs. I'm the first one in my family. My my oh, first wow. business started. Yeah, thank you. My my first business started I was I was in the Air Force here in the United States and I was I was lonely. I missed home and I got into uh cooking barbecue in my backyard for fun. Oh, and wow. then when my wife yeah, when my wife and I got married, we uh we had a discussion about how much I was spending on my backyard hobby and so my genius solution to this this argument was to uh go to my office and try to sell enough barbecue that I had made to break even so I didn't really want to be an entrepreneur I hadn't really considered that at all at that point you know I was reading a lot of books on leadership and 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 whatnot but nothing really on marketing yet or nothing on entrepreneurship and then the first time I sold a rack of ribs to somebody And all of a sudden I saw that like, oh, you could do something you really love and then turn it into profit. I just became really addicted to it. And that became that began the process of me spending the next year learning how to open a barbecue restaurant, get it started, finding co-founders, all you the things. You opened so a barbecue restaurant it. in the United States? Really? Yeah, oh that was my, my first business. God. Your first business. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it because I opened a restaurant here in the United Kingdom and I lost 200,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, is I, a, is a great when I, when I, uh, I, I, I have a lot of you know, entrepreneurs with the business, and sometimes I hear people that want to say, uh, okay, I want to spend sixty thousand per year, and I study a master in business administration. I'm always telling them, if you really want to learn about business, open a restaurant, you will see. <laughs> That's so true, though, because you you are you're in a hyper competitive industry when you open a restaurant. Wow. Uh, it's a very 
passionate industry because both people that work in the restaurant space and people that eat at restaurants are very passionate about their food. You know, it's a very emotional thing for a lot of people. And the margins, as you well know, are so thin. Um, I got really good at making a profit on a $6 sandwich at a 10% margin. And I think if you can learn how to run that P&L, if you can learn how to run that P&L, then all of a sudden running a services business or a higher margin business like we're doing now is much, much easier. Uh, uh, one, but of yeah, my, that one was... of the more chunder, one of the more complex PL than I've ever seen is the restaurant ones because you have a uh, food waste, you have margin, you have a staff, you have bills, you have, I mean, it's a huge operation. I didn't even have any clue what I was getting into. And, uh, <laughs> same. Yeah, but <laughs> I thought that was same like other business. Well, it's not. <laughs> a lot of mm-hmm. elements goes into that equation that, that they are not in, in other businesses. Like now, for example, you run a marketing agency, you know, the, yeah. is, is, um, the level of complexity. I mean, it's not that the business that you run is not complex, but um, the restaurant, oh boy. So... So people should like your 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 product, your your ribs or whatever you were cooking that that they were buying it, right? Yeah, we had a great product, and and I quickly learned that uh, what you do as a product or a service really doesn't matter. And and what I mean by that now is that people I... like us that are entrepreneurs are way too addicted to our own things. You know, we're very passionate about being into barbecue or uh, whatever restaurant you were in or uh, HVAC companies or something like that. Like you're really good at doing the thing. And all of a sudden, when you start a business, you're no longer the thing doer. You are now a business owner. You're an entrepreneur, which is a totally different job. And it's a totally different set of skills. And it took me a solid two and a half years to learn that lesson. And once I figured that out, all of a sudden, the business unlocked and we started scaling. And we ended up crossing you know, a million dollars in revenue for a 25, 30 seat restaurant, which was pretty good for us. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. And the only thing wow. that stopped us from going from where we were in the beginning to where we were at the end there was was a level of education that I hadn't had yet because this was my first time owning a business. And what ultimately and cost us that one, business man. was me not knowing what I was doing and having ego and a whole lot of other things that I'm happy to talk about. But I ended up crashing a business that I had built over six years. And within a period of like two months, all this momentum was just gone. And you got to be really careful when you're when you're on your own entrepreneurial journey. The the rule I have now is you don't want to bankrupt the brand and you don't want to bankrupt the business. Those are the two things you you. can't come back from. So any risk you take, take risk. Entrepreneurs take risk every day and that's fine. But if the risk you take, if it plays out and there's any chance that it ends up bankrupting your business or bankrupting your brand, like in bankrupting your brand, by the way, that means like huge PR crisis. You get canceled on the internet, like something like that. Like, are you taking a stand that you don't actually believe in and all those things? Mm-hmm. But if you can't come back from it, then you're just out of the game and you get to start all over, which is what I did. And I hope to only have to make that mistake one time. I try not to make the same mistake twice. I mean, Charlie, listen, <laughs> well, there is no entrepreneur out there that, that haven't done make mistakes. If I tell you about how many mistakes I make in business, you will cry here. I'm gonna depress you. So let's don't go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, like I said, you know, like uh, for me, the same thing, right? I, I own several business at the, I, uh, I started a very re- real estate successful business here in United Kingdom. We sold over 5 million, talking about 15 years ago, right? And, uh, and because I was bored, a lot of people talk about, um, about how to deal with failure, but nobody nobody talks about how to deal with success, right? Mm. And it happened that the business was running out to pylon. I was making a lot of money. And then uh, because literally I was bored and I did have a dream about to open a restaurant. Then I said, you know what? Right, I'm be here at watching TV uh, <laughs> and uh, I, at home getting all this money. Let me go and find my another dream, which is open the restaurant. Oh my God, the restaurant almost bring me to bankrupt and co- almost collapse the other businesses. And mm-hmm. again, it's what you say, lack of knowledge, right? Uh, and I like a lot what you say because um, business will learn by experience, right? And uh, and uh, the my issue with the restaurant, and I think like everybody's issue there, right? I think that my first business. The property are got lucky. Sometimes you get lucky, right? You have a pro that you can have a good margin. Marketing cost is very uh, low. The cost of acquisition and you make a good profit. And the mistake is to think that all businesses are like this. 
Mm. I just got lucky. However, the restaurant taught me the biggest lessons and probably everything I learned, it was not from my lucky business. It was for that failure, right? And mm. they, my biggest problem was that same, like you said, right? We are all very good at what we do, right? Meaning developing the product, right? Mm -hmm. But the pro is only 20% of the equation. Nobody told me that. I, it cost me 200,000 pounds to learn that, right? <laughs> I, the it's a great uh, ed, ed the college education. You go to marketing and sales. You know what I mean? If you cannot mm -hmm. market and say that, and again, what you said, right? Uh, is the pro the most important thing? I mean, the pro has to be good, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have a good pro, you have client that come back for the pro. But honestly, the fact that you can sell your product have nothing to do with the quality of your product. If mm -hmm. you're very good at marketing and sales, you will sell your product. The issue is that if the product is not good, the client won't come back again, right? You won't have mm -hmm. repeat clients, right? And people don't That's understand right. that, you know, that everybody put all the energy, um, all the effort, uh, because we don't know anything any better, right? In, mm -hmm. Oh, let me have the perfect BBQ. Let me let me have the perfect product and everything. And then you put all your knowledge or your energy or your money created the most amazing product. And then, huh, who's going to buy it? <laughs> I don't have resources. Yeah. How are going to bring all these people to buy it? I already spent all the money. And this well, is you can go you can go online and look up all the Google reviews in the world of places that have closed, whether it's a restaurant or your favorite econ brand or whatever. And you look at these reviews and they're they're very popular. You know, they're very positive reviews. They're over four and a half stars a lot of times for these different things. And you got to ask yourself, why isn't this successful? If people liked the product, then this company should be successful, but you're hundred percent right. It's, it's, it's maybe it's 20% or whatever the number is. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, is that your product doesn't matter. What, what matters is how many people know your product, you know, the story exactly. we tell, and this is how I got into marketing, honestly, now that I own a digital advertising agency, I'm, I'm obsessed with this whole thing. It's not the best products that win. It's the best known products that win here mm -hmm. in the States. We had a brand called Kmart. It's very similar to a, a Walmart or a target. You know, it's like, it's a huge big box store and they're gone. But here they were very popular for a very long time. And then they were just gone overnight. And it's it's not that they had an awareness problem. They had a emotional awareness problem. And what that means is that people knew who they were, but they didn't feel anything when they thought about them. And so mm -hmm. that's the second layer to being well known. Like, yeah, you got to be well known, but you got to create an emotion that drives people to do something you want them to do. Now, if you create a hyper negative emotion, all of a sudden that person is, they're going to go smack talk you online. They're going to spread the word negatively to all their friends. Uh, they're going to make some decisions you're not going to like, and it's all going to be in the wrong way. Versus if your marketing and product create a positive experience, all of a sudden they're much more happy to, to go share that and bring it around. And so it's not, you know, I don't believe that all press is good press. I truly don't believe that. I think if you want to have a long-standing business, it's built over, and you know this, right? It's built over decades of building trust, mm -hmm. and it takes about four seconds yeah. to erase it. And you got to be really careful when you're when you're marketing your business that you're not just like trying to go get attention, uh, because the attention will come with an emotion, and it could be the wrong one. And so you got to be really cognizant of that. So we mentioned some, we mentioned some that you have for the entrepreneurs of that that you know maybe they don't have experience, and they and they come and they will say, oh, you know what? I only care about have a good quality product. I don't care about the brand. I don't care about marketing. I don't, go, I don't care about sales. Uh, if my product is good, people will buy it. So what message do you have for these young entrepreneurs? You, you better be really good at making friends that want to be in business with you because you're not going to do it on your own. It's There's just, there may be, you know, I, I'm not a big absolutes guy. There could be examples out there where the founder of the company just really believed in the product and it was all the product and they had a magical word of mouth thing and like somehow that company made it. Those stories are fun to tell in movies. They're fun to write about in articles because they're the exception. They're okay, novel right? experiences. The only reason we're interested in those stories is because they don't ever happen. Exactly. And because they don't ever happen, that means they're interesting to look at. And so if you are going to be a product guy or girl, that's great. Do that. But be really self-aware of what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and find people to either be employees early on 
or straight up business partners that you give equity to, to be able to fill the gaps that you have. Because if you don't, you will find out very quickly that your passion and, 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 and knowledge base will only take you so far. And you're going to hit in the entrepreneur world, as you know, a plateau. You're going to, you're going to stop growing at some point. And until you learn the lesson at that plateau, you will never get beyond it. And you will very quickly, if you're just a product person, figure out, I've got the best product in the world and nobody wants it and nobody wants to talk about it. And when I give it to people, they love it and they say positive things, but then they don't buy it. I hear these stories all the time. And you I'm like, don't. you don't have a product problem. You have a you have an awareness problem more than likely. And if you don't have an awareness problem and you sell stuff and you're bad at delivering it, now you have a service problem. So it's just like, like, you're on a certain plateau at all times as an entrepreneur. And the only reason you're still on that plateau is because of some piece of information you're missing. And the information can either be gained by, uh, by finances, by being able to pay somebody for the information. Uh, you can go buy a bunch of books and see what you can learn on your own. You can make friends like you and I are now, and I can call you up someday and be like, Hey, I'm struggling with this. Like I'm losing 200 grand a year in my restaurant. Can you help me with that? So well, if it's about my next restaurant, I'll call you. <laughs> never again. Yeah. You'll tell me to not do it. That would be the move. <laughs> but it's, it's, if you want to go somewhere, you're not now like, and we'll get into this in a minute, like not to spoil anything at the end of the show about how do you make your first million. If you want to go somewhere you're not, you got to learn something you don't know. And then you got to get really good at implementing it. Yeah. And then, Charlie, it's about what you said. I'm glad that you brought this up, right? Because uh, here we're sharing the only through how it is, right? For us, it would be uh, to tell the fairy tale, oh, guys, you know, just, just focus on your product and you're going to be fine. But as you said, this is no uh, how things work. Is it happened exceptionally and becomes in news. And then because you read in the magazine, you might think that this is this is how what's happening out there. But the truth is that um, having a great product is only 20% of the whole equation, right? And you guys mm -hmm. need to manage your energy, your resources, and your funds uh, accurate because it's going to take more than that uh, for you to succeed to have a good product. Like, like Charles was saying, how many amazing products uh, that people love it, they haven't mm -hmm. made it because uh, this is only one part of the question is, in fact, good products is something that is very easy to find good products, right? Now, mm -hmm. to the when the complexity comes and people underestimate, especially when they're in the top of the small business, is the cost of acquisition of the client and how they, they don't have to only set the products they also have to start to be to build the brand, right? Because if you said you this completely different ball game, if you create the right foundation and you're trying to sell your product and building the brand parallel against what you were saying, not only brand awareness, but also that there is a feeling or, or it's a community that is around the, the brand. This is when uh the things are really gonna take off because uh you're gonna have a community that will come to your product again and again and again. So in your view, Shanda, uh, how, um, where do you think that uh, the small business owners can find more information uh, and, and, and to have, and to find like a blueprint, right? Where, how all this uh, system works uh, after you have a good product? Well, man, that's the, that's a billion dollar question. I feel like, <laughs> right. Like it's everybody wants to know how to make things work. I can tell you that right now what's working in marketing specifically is, is a few things. One, you got to have a clean website. Well, actually, let me take it back one further. Your branding has to be so on point nowadays. Like there's so much messaging out there in the world now that if you don't have a clear brand that clearly creates a feeling again back to this emotion thing i've got one pitch and it's create emotions with people that you want to create you, your brand has to start that emotional process from the from the name of the company you choose to the logo you choose to the colors to the fonts um it's worth the money on the front end to pay five six thousand dollars whatever it ends up being you know i've seen crazy numbers go up to like 50 grand it's probably not that much for people to get a brand book but like pay three to five grand work with a branding consultant and get your brand dialed all the way in and do that first because everything you do after that is going to build off of that core branding message. And 
And it's much easier to do that on the front end and not have to go back in the future and refix a bunch of things. Or oh, rebranding is very expensive, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, people make brand very complicated. I like to make brand a simple because I'm just a simple barbecue guy, right? For me, a brand is what story does that customer tell about you? And the story can be either positive or it can be negative, but that's your brand to that person. And if you want to build a really big brand, i.e. like a like let's say McDonald's, right? International company, you know, thousands and thousands of locations, they have a billion customers telling the same story about them again and again and again and again. So they have a positive brand with those people. There's some people that hate McDonald's because they don't value the same things they value. They don't value that story. But McDonald's until recently has been very clear on who they serve, why they serve them, and they try to do everything they can to create that story. Now, McDonald's has gotten in trouble recently because they've jacked up their prices to try to take advantage of this inflationary environment that we're in. And now all of a sudden, 18 months, 24 months later, we're seeing a bunch of customer backlash. And now McDonald's is coming out going, oh, you know, we got to get back to our customers. We've got to do what they, you know, what, what they need from us. And now we've got these $5 uh, value meals, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it's such a joke, but they've gotten away from who they were. They forgot what their brand was and it hurt their sales. Mm -hmm. So branding is where we start from there. You, your digital if even if if you're only a digital company, obviously your website's important. But if you have a brick and mortar store, your website is still really, really important. I tell people that are just getting into business for the first time and they're asking me about websites. I'm like, think about it like a digital version of your brick and mortar store. When people come to your brick and mortar store online, it should be very clear what you want them to do. Where do you want them to walk? What items do you want them to see? What actions do you want them to take? When I go to any store that's a well-run store or restaurant or whatever, it's very clear what you want me to do. And most people get in trouble with websites because they try to make it do too much. It's too noisy, too many words. It's too much. If you go to Hybe Marketing's website, our website, it's very clear what I want you to do. Book a discovery call. And there's a bunch of things pointing you in that direction. I'm trying to lead you through our store to get you to the cash register, which is where I want you to be. So once you build out your website, from there, you need to set up your email marketing, which is another way to like build your own ecosystem, send out weekly newsletters, keep people top of mind with you. Uh, from there, you got to get really good at content marketing. And content marketing is stuff like this on this podcast. It could be social media content, pictures, all those kind of things. Like content marketing at its core is really just storytelling. Again, everything we're doing, we're trying to create an emotion. The website should create emotion. The brand creates an emotion. The email list is the newsletter is creating an emotion. And now with storytelling on social media, you're now creating more positive emotions. And all these emotions are making people more and more aware of you. And they're making you like you more, right? And then after that, after you figured out how to do organic social, then we recommend working with a company like ours to run paid ads where you're spending money to drive sales into the business. Well, what most people do though, is they do it backwards. They kind of like very inexpensively put a brand together because there's no real ROI in it, right? They don't, they're like, I'm going to pay what for a logo? Like, no, I'll just go into Canva and like doodle something and we're good. And so they don't do that. Uh, they, they throw up a website together that their like niece made for them. Uh, for in five minutes for free. Uh, they don't do email marketing because that seems too complicated and they can't really grasp that. Uh, they may mess around with some organic social stuff just because they'll get on there and post like, I got this for sale, I got this for sale, I got this for sale. And then they wonder why their organic social media channels never grow and they never drive any business from that. And then they start trying to run digital ads on either Google or Facebook or whatever. And then they go like, oh, these digital ads don't work from a business either. And like marketing doesn't work and I'll just continue to grow in word of mouth. And like, I got to have a soapbox thing for a second. People that say marketing doesn't work drive me crazy because it's like you live in a world where the biggest companies in the world are spending billions of their precious shareholder dollars on marketing. And you're telling me those people that only map to successful shareholder relationships, basically, uh, are wasting money on marketing. Like, no, they know it works. They they have a plan for it and they're just better at it than you. And because they've been around longer, they, they and, and I'm empathetic to a small business owner because I used to be, I am one now, but I used to be a brick and mortar business owner where it was like, I had to make the barbecue, wash the dishes and market my business. I understand when you're a startup, especially exactly. what bootstrapping actually feels like. It doesn't matter though. Like you wanted to be an entrepreneur. You wanted to put it in your Instagram bio that you're an entrepreneur on your LinkedIn or wherever the hell you, you brag about it. And now this is the world you live in. This is now the game you're playing. And so part of that is that the, the deck is stacked against you. Boo-hoo. Like you've got to learn how to do all this stuff on your own and to just chalk it up to it doesn't work is insane to me because 
everybody else is doing it and getting results from it. And you're the one special situation you're telling me that it's not going to work for. Like, tell me how that makes sense, Harry. Like you explain that to me. I don't understand. Oh, well, tell me about it. And uh, it gets even worse, right? The When they, the companies, you know, they as soon as they take a financial hit and sales decrease, uh, the brilliant decisions that they they usually take is, oh, you know what? Let's reduce the budget in marketing. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, wow, guys. Even when COVID, when, when COVID came, right? Everybody, you were talking to everyone. Everybody was saying, no, uh, we have this COVID thing. So you know what? We're cutting our budget in, in marketing. And I, and I was telling them, no, 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 man, put the, put the food in the gas. You don't know. <laughs> you, yep. you don't know what, 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 uh, what is going to come to you. You know, it's, it's the totally opposite. I don't understand. Um, and it's simple, right? Especially with pay advertising, right? I, I do this simple exercise with entrepreneurs. Right. If if you are selling your product for twenty pounds, right, and then your cost of advertising is five pounds, right, and let's suppose that you're making ten pound profit, okay, right, out of this exercise. So how much you will invest in advertising, in the pay advertising? And then the another is doing the math. Well, one thousand. I'm telling the man all your money, everything because you make a profit. You take this money and you recycle again and put in the advertising. And you're mm -hmm. making ten quid all the time. You can do this all mm -hmm. your life. That you, I, in fact, is the only thing that you need to do. That's mm -hmm. it. You you already sold for life. And once you crack this equation, okay. And invested. They, I think the the unrealistic thing that people think about it is like, oh, half of a project, the product, right? And I'm not gonna invest in marketing. I'm not gonna invest in everything. And the product's gonna sell out of the sky, right? And yeah, you you might say something. You know, your friends can tell your friends for referral for this and that. And but if you want to have a consistency, right? And this is where the challenge comes is when you can design a marketing strategy that actually makes uh, a profit um a profit um as i say i have one friend of mine right he specializes in in e-commerce right and and he's struggling finding clients right and he promised to every of his client that he will increase the conversion 20 percent right or why they gave him the money back yeah and I'm looking at my friend and I said, man, I don't understand why you're struggling finding clients because this is a no-brainer for everybody. They already yeah. have certain sales. You go in there and you tell them, listen, I will increase you 20%. You pay me monthly X amount. If I don't achieve this, I gave all your money back. Yeah. And still he's telling me, oh, hard, it's difficult to find a client because they don't see. But <laughs> And I say, you taking away all the risks. So this, this is what we think in terms of marketing. That people don't understand it's like an investment. It's like a cash point. It's like an, an asset. You just invest and you get a return. And uh, mm -hmm. why do you think that entrepreneurs have a huge challenge in uh, understanding this, uh, how mm -hmm. actually this works? Why do you think yeah. it's a problem? Uh, they, they, they're worried about cash flow. And cash flow is the number one reason small businesses close. It's it's 36, 37 percent of small businesses here in the States close in the first five years due to cash flow issues or lack of sales, which really just translates to more cash flow issues. Yeah, but you're bit tight today and you sell your product tomorrow when it's but that's the But that's the thing is that you, you most people look at that like I'm going to invest 10 grand in advertising. And the majority of businesses, you know this, don't get over a million million dollars a year or a million pounds a year in revenue. Like most businesses live below that threshold. And the businesses that live below that threshold, again, they have a they have a plateau they're at with a knowledge barrier or a talent barrier. And it, if it's a marketing thing, they don't understand that, okay, I'm going to deploy my money. I'm going to invest it in marketing and and then I'm going to get a return. And what, what ends up happening, and we've seen this a lot. They they may have tried it at some point, but there could have been a couple of things they did wrong. Number one, they hired an agency to do the ads for them. And in my world, 
agency gurus are like a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. Somebody watches the YouTube channel. Now all of a sudden they got an agency and it's, it's just ripe, man. It's so bad. Know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Then there's so many people that maybe they know, but maybe they're bad actors. I don't know. Like 80% of our clients right now have a bad experience with the previous agency. It's my number one selling uh, factor. I try to find out if you had a bad experience with an agency as fast as possible. Cause I know I can sell it to you after that where I'm like, Oh, well, let me tell you about what we've designed to fix that problem. So like, number one, they've had a bad experience in a previous relationship with an agency. And now they don't, they don't, they think all agencies suck. They think marketing is a joke, all the things. And so they're going to stay where they're at. Or they think like most entrepreneurs do that are bootstrapping. I can just do it all myself and I can do it better than anybody else. And, and it'll be fine. Well, it's a well, huge learning that, curve. Huge. <laughs> You got to learn how to delegate, right? You got to learn how to get the right people on the bus and trust them to make the right decisions. And, you know, you guide them and direct them. But that, that's a big skill set. Again, that's not doing the thing, right? It's it's owning a business now. It's a totally different skill set you got to learn. Uh, or the third thing is, is that they just, they truly have a belief that like marketing won't work for their business. And they've, they're they addicted to word of mouth and referrals. And they like, I, I talk to my customers. They say, John or Jeff or Sally sent them in. And that's that's word of mouth and that's free. And so we're going to just keep doing that. And it's like, you you can't grow a big business on just word of mouth alone. It no just way. does not, does not work. Um, and so I think a myriad of those three problems, plus the pressures of cash flow on a business under a million dollars in revenue, create a perfect storm where these guys, they just don't want, or they're not excited at least to learn how to invest in marketing and get into it because it's expensive, good companies. I mean, we have, we have some data on this, but like, you're spending anywhere between five and 25% of revenue on marketing. And you're going to look at a guy that's pretty new to investing in marketing. You're going to say, Hey, like in your example, every $20, I'm going to expect you to spend $5 to make it. And like, I know that in a call I've done that. Like, like this has happened to me so many times on the sales call. That sounds like a great idea. Well, what happens in month one, month two, when we're really doing eight, nine, ten dollars to get that twenty dollars? Because there is a learning curve to launching any new brand with advertising. And now all of a sudden they're going, This was not what I agreed to. This is this is half the revenue and da da da. And so it's like you gotta you gotta push through that. You like you said, you have to unlock how these ads drive revenue for your business. Um and, and then just figure it out. And like the worst part is is that even if you figure that out and you get good at the five for 25 thing that you're talking about, right? There's still a world where that caps out because only so many people know, like, and trust you. Like marketing is all about creating people that know you, like you, and trust you. Uh, what most people do with advertising is they take everybody that already knows, likes, and trusts you, and they just capitalize on that relationship. They they do a return on ad spend campaign where it's like, I spent the $5, I got the 20 back. It's a 4X return on ad spend. I'm very happy with that. But then they start to scale their ads up, and they hit a plateau again. And now ROAS starts to trickle down to 3X and 2X. And when you're addicted to a 4X return on ad spend, oh, yeah, and yeah. You've, got, you've got, I won the lottery eyes where you're going, I'm going to the moon on this. All of a sudden, you realize that's not the case. And what you've got to evolve to next is brand awareness advertising and becomes exactly. 80% of your budget. And return on ad spend advertising becomes 20% of your budget. Like rough numbers there, right? But imagine that. Now you're telling an entrepreneur that just got used to the trading cash for more cash scenario. And now you're going to look at him and go, all right, listen, for six months, I want you to hold your breath. And 80% of your advertising budget is going to go to just making you more well-known amongst ideal customers. How do you I'm feel about that? Yep. Yeah. And then they go, I'm not doing that because 60 <laughs> days in some of them, you know, they'll say, I'm not doing that. 60 days in they, they look back and they go, revenue didn't explode. And I tripled my ad spend. Like what is happening? And it's, it's all, it's all momentum based and you, mm. you cannot build a business on the back of random acts of marketing. You got to have a strategy. You need a plan to execute the strategy and you got to have the discipline to be consistent with it over a long enough period of time. Entrepreneurs have shiny object syndrome like nobody's business, right? We love the new thing and we love to fixate on today's problem because we come from a bootstrapped environment. And again, that's a thing that you got to learn how to leave in the past if you want to grow your business beyond that magical million dollar mark. Here in the States, you've made it as an entrepreneur if you've crossed either a million dollars in revenue on an annual basis or you've made it five years in the business because it takes about either that much money 
or that much time in business to figure out how the game works in your industry. And people get in trouble because they'll open one business, try it for six, seven months, it doesn't work, and then they go to the next thing, and then they go to the next thing. And then they they kind of got one thing working and they get excited, so they go back to the high of opening something new again. Now they got two businesses. and I, <laughs> They didn't double their problems, right? Harry, when you open multiple business, what do you do? You quadruple your problems. Opening more business yeah. is an exponential problem creator. Yeah, it is it. not. We have a roller oh, yeah. coaster with this. Yeah, we have a lot of fun, but it was a lot of a, a roller coaster, yeah? So mm -hmm. now, yeah, because at the end of the day is, and these people, right, that they're investing in brand awareness. Uh, at the end of the day, when you're selling your business, you're not selling a business, you're selling your brand. So when uh, this brand awareness is building your brand, is is what actually give value to to the business. And and same chance, like, you know, yeah, you can run a campaign of advertising, you can make a huge return, right? But this is going to be for set that demographic and target uh, demographic, but guess what? Yeah, eventually we finish. And then <laughs> sooner or later it's going to finish. And then mm -hmm. when it's finished, now you are in the real world where you have to penetrate the market, where you have to mm -hmm. uh, make your own space against your competitor. And you mm -hmm. need to 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 get uh, what we call it a marketplace, right? Market penetration, right? Mm -hmm. And this is yeah. this is reality. This is, this well, is success the, breeds copycats, right? So even if you found a miraculous, like undiscovered niche, like you've gone out into the world and combined two things that never existed before, and now you've got this new thing, like how long are you going to be able to live in a world where nobody's competing with you? After Somebody six overseas. Months, after six months, you have someone in your back for sure. Yeah, and that's that's <laughs> and, everybody and, from and, like and, worldwide and, and, manufacturing. <laughs> To local restaurants, like if you opened a very successful barbecue restaurant in England, all of a sudden everybody's going, I should get into the barbecue oh, business because yeah. that dude's got a line out the door. Yeah. yeah. Probably better than you with more resources and everything. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and better yep. know how. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then now you need to build your brand and you have to mm -hmm. make sure that you own a, a, the biggest share as possible in, in the marketplace. So, Shande, what are mm -hmm. the five steps to make your first million? So this is my advice, and this is uh, this is it works for me. There's probably a million ways to do it, but this is this is my my thought. Um, I think there's no better way to become a millionaire than to own your own business. I think that you can do it over a long period of time, investing in stocks, and you're kind of a business owner even then. You're just doing it on small little chunks over time. But there is no way, like you know, hobby marketing started three years ago. We've doubled our revenue every single year, wow, and there's no return like that in the stock market, right? Now that is 10 years of me learning how to be an entrepreneur in one failed business already. So this is not a, like, don't hear me. I'm not selling you a course. I got nothing for you here. Like this is not a <laughs> 90 days to your Only first million. Truth. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. So these are like five general concepts that, that I, you know, that's all these books, all these books behind me, they all fall into one of these categories. Like this is a continuous exercise for me to try to get better in these five areas. So the first thing I want you to do is like get comfortable with owning a business and being that something you want to do. Number two is you got or like that. And so like owning a business isn't enough. Like you got to figure out what business to own. And so like I like to use a three uh, circle Venn diagram over one of the circles you put. Um, what are you passionate about? What are the things, all the things in life you're very passionate about? Write them all in there. In the next circle that overlaps, right? What are you proficient in? So like, what are you actually good at? You know, so in my example, I was passionate about barbecue and I was passionate about marketing proficient at, I'm proficient at both making barbecue and doing marketing. And then the third circle is probably the most important circle is the profit circle. You got to figure out how much money can you make with each one of these opportunities? Well, barbecue restaurants, you can make so much money with marketing agencies as a B2B service agency, a lot more money. And so I was like, cool, if all things being equal, I'm going to use that as a thing. So that was the next business I started. So if you you start there, you figure it out, okay, what most people do when they start a business is they're like, oh, I just, I liked this thing and they just get into it. And then they're all of a sudden they look up five years later and it's like, oh, I had a restaurant losing 200 grand a year. Like, what are you doing starting a restaurant here? Are you just chasing, you're just chasing the dream, man. What are you doing over there? Huh? But it's like, you would have avoided a lot of pain had you been able to go through that exercise on the front end where you go like, no, 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 it's really real estate. And it's like, let me let me do something new in real estate or something different or something more exciting, right? Like maybe maybe I rent the restaurants out because those triple net leases are a real piece of work. <laughs> that's all I got to say about that, right? Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing you got to get really good at is selling. You got to learn how to sell. Like even if you don't own your own business, the fastest way to make money 
in a job is to sell because that is the most important thing to any enterprise in the world, like learning how to sell the thing. At the barbecue restaurant, I was able to upsell at the register. I was able to sell catering. I was able to practice a lot. Now oh, at the wow. agency, I'm selling multi thousand dollar packages across a year. Like, like without the ability to sell, you know, where you identify pain points and position yourself as a solution, like it's, it's going to be really hard for you to, to grow your business. Let's say you invent the best uh, foot cream in the world that makes your feet smell like angels, right? Like unless you learn how to like tell that story and sell it one-on-one -on -one to people, no, you're no. never going to get anywhere because you're not just selling like in that world, in that specific example, now you're selling to wholesale distributors. So you're at trade shows and you're talking to buyers and you're going to have to sell why they should buy a giant pallet of this product and put it on their shelves. And if you're not good at selling, you're not getting anywhere. Uh, number three is marketing. And at the core of marketing, we've talked a lot about marketing here, so I don't need to re, re rehash it a lot, uh, is storytelling. You have to become psychotically good at telling stories, beginning, middle, ends, rising action, falling action, keeping people hooked, giving them a clear call to action at the end. Like, like storytelling in today's world, media companies are everywhere. Every single company in the world is a media company now. That is like that is, it's just a fact of being, we, we all are media companies and our ad breaks are the products or services we sell. Like that's basically where we're at now. And if you want to run a successful media company, AKA marketing, you have to be really good at storytelling. Um, and the cool thing about storytelling and sales is those two things overlap, which is like these, these, are, these skills don't live in a vacuum, right? They kind of all build together to make you a more um, profitable entity. Let's call it that. Uh, the next thing is operations. You have to learn how to operate. Like you got to learn how to organize people. You got to learn how to build systems, right? Like checklist recipe cards in the restaurant business, right? Like if you're getting on a sales call, like your podcast, for instance, has a great system. Got plenty of emails leading up to it. I knew exactly when it was. The booking oh, was you. very <laughs> systematized. It's very scalable that way, right? And it and it lessens your time. You're a very good operator, I can tell just from this podcast, right? But that is a that is a skill set that you've learned that now has created a bunch of extra time that you can either delegate to a um, a lower paid individual that that is not as the same compensation level as you. But if you don't have a clear operating system, uh, you're going to be the one that goes in and backfills all of those broken things. And your time is expensive. As the owner, your time is the most expensive in the business. And so you've got to learn the operation side of things. Uh, and the last thing is you have to learn how to be a leader. If you're not going to have a solo entrepreneur business, which if you are having a solo entrepreneur business, like more power to you, you probably don't need this part. You know, it's probably just good to make you a good human in general. But unless you learn how to lead other humans and leading is not bossing and leading is not managing. Managing goes in operations, by the way. Managing is operations. Hey, John, you said you do 20 sales calls this week. You did five. That is managing. Leading is going into that same meeting with John and going, okay, every week before this week, you've hit 20 calls. This week, you hit five. What's going on, man? Everything okay at home? That question is leadership. Management is going, if you don't get your shit together, I swear to God, I'm going to kick you out of here. Like, that's bad management. Good leadership is caring about the person, putting their needs first. Good leadership should suck for the leader. Like it's painful. It's 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 both. It's like being a parent, right? I don't know if you have kids or anything, Harry, but like I've got two kids and it is both the best thing I've done in my life and the hardest thing I've done in my life. And if you're a good parent, it's a dichotomy between those two things all the time. And that's what leadership is. And so if you combine those five things um, you can at least get to where I'm at because that's basically the lessons I've learned at this point. And I'm, I'm sure there's some other stuff, some other plateaus that I'm at, some lacking education. And uh, I'm always on a continuing education journey. So any any recommendations you have for me, man, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> and then, uh, Shanda, I want to ask you a personal question because, you know, even you, you have kids, right? And so how important can be, you know, because, you know, when you started your own business, right, um, you put a lot of work into it, and uh, it's not the same, like, uh, for example, I cry, I, I, I cried very few, few times in my life, but the day that I closed this restaurant, I literally cried, I'm, I like put, uh, not because of the, I lost the money, it's because I also lost like two years of my life, I was working there from mm. Monday to Sunday, 11 hours every day, right, and and I, I have a sense of frustration, right? And uh, 
that I couldn't make it work and I really believe that I can make it work, but it didn't actually work, right? I, uh, I tried everything and uh, I didn't have enough knowledge to make this thing work, right? And um, But you carry this negative baggage, right? And this frustration. Now you need to go back and, and rebuild yourself again, so like uh, take care of the other business, uh, make sure you come back in a different shape, right? And all these negative moments and frustration, I think for sure, for you should be the same, you know, like after working so many years, a bit in a brand, a good pro, somehow uh, you have to close it. So this anger and this frustration, right? How you manage to, to funnel that, right? So uh, now you come back uh, with a different business, like look mm. for example, you are you are growing now in mm. a double every year, which it means that you actually have work on yourself. Let all that um, negativity and anger go away and turn into a positive. So, how do you find help? So, do you do some meditation? Do you write some books? Mm. Uh, how do you manage to uh, to funnel all this? Because it's, it it gets frustration. I know because I've been there. And um, yeah. you you can you can end up in a place really really angry and you know shouting to your kids or to your wife they haven't mm. done anything to you you're just angry because you know you work really hard and didn't work so yeah. how you manage to work on yourself and and to grow personally and 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 just accept it that this is business sometimes works sometimes it doesn't we need to move up and coming back in a different way I'm gonna do better mm. yeah. Uh... I, I love that question because I, I think that is a – that's something I underestimated or didn't even think about when I started my first business. I, I like most entrepreneurs, I'm optimistic and I think to myself, I'm going to be the biggest thing in whatever and there will be nothing but sunshine and rainbows from here until eternity. And like, yeah, we might take some small losses, but like I'm not going to be – uh, one of these major flops, blah, blah, blah. And turned out I did because I'm an idiot and I did the wrong thing. And – I, I start with – I read a book a while back by a guy named Simon Sinek called The Infinite Game, and The Infinite Game was a great book, but I'll give you the basic takeaway from it, which was entrepreneurship, commerce, capitalism, whatever – is an infinite game, which means it goes on forever. It's not playing – it's not like playing uh, football or soccer, right? Like that game ends, and there's a clear winner and a clear loser most of the time. I know soccer is weird. Sometimes there's ties, but you, you get the analogy. Oh, yeah. um, the last time I checked in the city that my barbecue restaurant was in, and I'm sure the city they're, they're in the UK where your restaurant is, there are still restaurants and you've been closed for a while and there's still barbecue restaurants where I used to live and they're still serving barbecue. The game goes on forever. And so when I started the, the restaurant originally as an entrepreneur, I thought if I just get here, I'll make it and everything gets easier and I'll live this lavish lifestyle and blah, 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 blah. And after it closed, I got to do some reflection and some learning and some thinking about this whole infinite game versus a fixed game mindset. And I realized like, oh, it truly is the old saying of, of the journey is the reward. And so you better get very happy with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I had grown over six years to take for granted what I had built. I took for granted the employees I had, the momentum I had, the money I had, the the, all the things I took it all for granted because I was taking again bankrupting the business risk constantly, and they happened to all work. And then one time they didn't, and then the business disappeared. But I took it for granted, and so I got to take two years off and go work for another company, two companies actually, in between the barbecue restaurant closing and high beam marketing opening. In that two year span, I got to do a lot of reflecting. I got to be very grateful again for like, man, I wish I still had the restaurant. I don't have freedom. You know, like the minute somebody tells you what to do and you can go vacation here, you can do this here. You can't do this within the job, even though that's going to make it better. Like all those things bugged the crap out of me. And it you was a good reminder. You become an entrepreneur in the first place, right? You remember. Yep. And so for me, it was that two year period in between where I got to reflect on all the lessons learned originally, plus the addition of this game doesn't end. For any of us, even if you sold for millions of dollars, like it still doesn't end like you, you that particular game ended, but the seasons go on. And so, like, what are you playing for? Like, that's my question, you know. And so when you look at your restaurant that closed, I would hope, at least based on my experience, that you'd look at that and go, OK, here's what I did well. 
Here's what I'm going to take into the next business venture. Here's what I completely screwed up and I'm going to not bring into the next venture. And here's some things I wish I could have tried that I'm going to try to re reintegrate into the next thing, right? And so as long as you can do that, you'll you'll end up in a healthy place. And and again, back to what I said earlier, if you if you're constantly making the same mistake over and over and over again, like that's a you issue. And you're going to have to look into the mirror and go like, "Why am I constantly creating the and same mistake. Why easy. why can't I beat this one dragon and get to the next level? Right. And it's it's there's that's a whole other podcast, I think, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And the, yeah, and at the end of the day, yes, we have to to work on ourselves and analyze what happened. But the truth is that you know, every time that behind any failure of the entrepreneur, what we call it failure, is a big lesson. I think I'm more grateful for the time that I fail, and especially the time that I lose money, right? And that that sounds weird, but you see, every time that I lose money is when I learn the most. Mm, yeah. Whatever, yeah. I only so sometimes no this that, but when you lose money, you 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 get the, that lesson, right? You say, oh, you know what? This doesn't happen again because you know yeah. you lost money, right? So. Harry, hey. I'm the complete opposite. I've lost so much money now. I uh Oh, I, you're I hate a genius it. now. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. avoid it like the plague. <laughs> oh my god, you're an encyclopedia now because like I said, you know, when uh, they this is this is one stick. And in the end of the day, you know, we we sometimes in business you get lucky, but at the end of the day, we we always said, you know, it's 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 all about being a good entrepreneur, it's about developing developing a skill, right? Some of them mm. we get faster than the other one. But this is no, you can read a lot of books and can help you out. But at the end of the day, it's like driving or swimming. The more you do it, the better you become, right? And yeah, you're going right. to fail. But every time you fail, like Chandra did, you know, you, you like we have all have done, we come back in a different form. At least you know what mm. you don't want in your life, right? After I was crazy about having this restaurant, but after I finished the restaurant, I have clearly, very clear picture what type of business I don't want to be in. That's right. So I choose yeah. carefully now what type of business I want to be, what I want and what I don't want, right? And, mm -hmm. and so, and you can design, because that's the other thing, you can design a nice business for you. One, you have the experience and one, you have, you, after your failure, you, mm -hmm. have, you are in better position to design a business that works for you and also, you know, come allow you time to spend time with your children, time with your family, mm -hmm. time with everything. I have a client that owns 300 supermarkets, have 4,000 employees, I have a headquarters. And for me, even thinking about him, I already get tired and depressed, you know, because I don't see myself with 4,000 employees, you know what I mean, with this headache. But this is what he likes, you know, he's... He's uh, passionate about this. He's happy, you know. He has board meetings every day. And, you know, so every uh, way. <laughs> well, go back to that. design the life, you yeah. know, in the way. The way yeah, you go back you to want, that. Right? You, yeah, you go back to that that proficiency, passion, and profit circle we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. The profit piece of that is really important to think through. Because I know a guy that owns a barbecue restaurant where he works in it every day. They're closed two days a week. He's closed for two weeks every fall. Like he is, he owns a lifestyle business and it's, it's going to be capped at a certain level of income. And he's so happy mm -hmm. with it because he gives him his life the exact way wow, that he, he loves, wants. Yeah. And then there's some people that open like your friend, 400 units. And it's like, that is great for him. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of this is self-awareness. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. It's massive. But it's like, yeah. again, it's self-awareness of like, what do you actually want? want and are you yeah. okay with what you want? And or is what you want being driven by other people, by pressure that you are putting on yourself or like the media is putting on you or God forbid your parents or like mm -hmm. family or whatever, your wife, your husband, like, like, why are you wanting what you want? And if you can't clearly answer that, then you're going to get in trouble. Yeah, because you might be designing business that is no good for you. And with that, no chance. Thank you so much for your time. That have been amazing. Uh, and for every um, to sum up, remember if you're an entrepreneur out there, you have to work 360. It's not only about uh, design your own business and making money. Remember, right? You need to learn 
out of your your mistake because in case of Chandra, you know, if he make a mistake, he's not only affecting himself, he's affecting himself, but also he shouldn't. Mm -hmm. However, if you come back in a different form, now you can design a life that you can uh, achieve million dollars mm -hmm. in sales and also you can spend whatever time you want with your children because the Chandra tomorrow decide to go and take the kids for holiday for four months, nobody can stop him because he designed a business that uh, he had this kind of freedom. And this, I think this is the, big, the biggest payoff that all this that. So if you need marketing help, please contact Shander. What is the website that they can find you? Uh, highbeammarketing.com. You? Okay, I, please. I just, hi, hi, yeah, we, you can find us at highbeammarketing.com. Very good. Please make sure you send us the details in the website by, by WhatsApp and then we put it in the description. And for every single one of you watching the podcast, see you in our next episode, How Brave Entrepreneurs Achieve the First Million in Sales. Bye for now. Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential, audacious entrepreneurs that overcame challenges and adversity, providing you with the blueprint of how they sold their first million so you can grow your business exponentially. 